A family torn asunder when their daughter vanishes without a trace. Her best friend desperately tries to solve the mystery of her disappearance. On today's episode of How It's Made, dolls? Wait, dolls? Doll? You're telling a doll story? Weak. Siesta time, man. <sighs> Wake me up if it gets good. Dolls? I'm Brona, unless you ask my p And this is Are You Afraid of the Snark? As with any episode of Are You Afraid of the Dark, we begin with children gathering around a campfire in the woods at what I can only assume is midnight because they call themselves the Midnight Society. But kids lie all the time, so who knows? What I do know is that I wasn't allowed out of the house at midnight when I was like 12. There were only two rules for kids in the 90s, don't talk to strangers, and be home when the streetlights come on. Anyway, on this particular midnight or whenever, Tucker is super excited that Betty Ann is tonight's storyteller because Gary told him she tells pretty weird stories. Betty Ann's up tonight. I told him Betty Ann tells really weird stories, and he's been looking forward to it ever since. If these names mean nothing to you, don't worry. They don't mean anything to me either. What's important to know, Gary will grow up to be gay, Tucker will grow up to play Jason in Mean Girls, and Betty Ann does tell pretty weird stories. She also brings props, apparently, and without warning, she pulls a porcelain doll out of her bag. No restraints, no protective gear, this brave young girl raw dogs a real live porcelain doll in her bare hands. Tucker acts like this is not the most terrifying and courageous act he's ever seen, scoffs at the idea of a doll story, and pretends to go to sleep because boys have to be tough or whatever. And it's midnight and he's like seven. Betty Ann declares they let him sleep and submits for the approval of the Midnight Society. The tale of the doll maker. We're introduced to Melissa, who has visited her Aunt Sally and Uncle Pete ever since she can remember, and mostly, it was boring. Pretty much a total drag. Until the murder happened. Well, until the Hendersons moved next door. But for all I know, the reason they moved in is because the previous owner was murdered. The Hendersons have a daughter, Susan, who Melissa is so excited to see because, allegedly, they're best friends. Where's Susan? Thought she'd be here waiting for me. But uh-oh, Aunt Sally tells her that the Hendersons have moved back to town early this year and is suspiciously vague about the whole thing. I'm sorry, Melissa, but the Hendersons moved back to town early this spring. But why? They love this place. Well, well we, we don't exactly know why. But maybe Melissa would have known about this if she, I don't know, talked to her best friend every now and then. Later on, Melissa is speaking to her mom on a corded phone. Classic. No, Mom, the trip was fine, but the Hendersons have moved. Susan Henderson, remember? We hung out all the time. Now I'm starting to wonder if Melissa maybe just doesn't like Susan all that much. Maybe Susan isn't even real and is just a figment of Melissa's imagination. Aunt Sally comes in to tell Melissa that it's almost time for bingo, and Melissa is more excited about this than she's ever been about anything in her whole entire life. Bingo! Including Susan. The next day, Melissa is sitting on a tire swing, and Uncle Pete asks if she wants to help him fix the septic tank. I got some work to do on the septic tank. Wanna lend a hand? Because he isn't like other uncles. He's a cool uncle and knows what kids are into these days. Scat. Probably because she's an ungrateful, lazy millennial, she sarcastically makes it clear that she does not want to help and would much rather stare off at Susan's house all day like someone waiting for their baby reindeer. Septic tank. Gee, sounds like fun, but uh, no thanks. Suddenly, a curtain moves in one of the windows, and it couldn't be the wind, because wind is a lie made up by the liberal media as a form of alternative energy. It must have been Susan. And so, our little Harriet the Spy wanders over to investigate the mystery of the moving curtain. She enters the house without knocking like she goddamn owns the place and starts calling out to no answer. But she keeps it up.
If there's anyone in that house, sweetheart, they don't want to talk to you. She comes to the end of a hall and finds a closet, and as anyone who finds themselves alone in somebody else's house would do, she immediately starts rummaging through it. To her great surprise, the closet has no back and just keeps going and going until she emerges in a snowy woods with one singular lamppost. Cool. Okay, that's another story. But she does find a staircase, which begs the question nobody ever asks, why the f*** are the stairs to the attic hidden in the back of a closet? What flowers in the attic nonsense is this? The attic is your run-of-the-mill attic. Infrequently used items, furniture being stored away, Susan's brother, who we don't talk about, and of course, a fancy dollhouse. Melissa is almost as excited to see the dollhouse as she was about Bingo, and decides to peep through the windows. Inside the dollhouse, a door slams itself shut, terrifying Melissa and causing her to fall over. She concludes that it must have been a mouse after seeing a mouse trap, and the camera pans over to a mouse in the corner saying, F*** my drag. Ignoring that mouse, because... It didn't happen. Melissa is mesmerized by an ornate door and slowly reaches for the knob when Aunt Sally stops her and asks why she's been snooping around. I really don't think you should be snooping around up here. Now, come on. I'm not snooping around. As if she didn't just enter a house uninvited, look through multiple rooms, rummage through a closet, and peep through the windows of another smaller version of the house. I thought maybe Susan had come back. But her aunt is like, listen, you little brat, I already told you Susan is dead. Back in town. The curtain moving was probably just Aunt Sally all along, even though she absolutely did not respond to Melissa calling hello. The Hendersons asked us to watch over the place, and it's not a responsibility I take lightly. They left a lot of precious things behind. Like what? <laughs> like Susan. That's when the truth comes out. The Hendersons didn't just move away. Last winter, Susan disappeared. Because Susan was a blonde white girl, the whole entire town held a search party for her, but to no avail. Her parents were heartbroken. They wanted to stay in case she came back, but in the end, they couldn't stand to live in that house any longer. They're keeping it, though, just in case she ever comes back. Because there's definitely no way she could just stay at Sally's place if that happened. That night, on Sally and Uncle Pete are arguing directly outside the room where Melissa is trying to sleep. Pete thinks, and he's right for this, they should have just told Melissa the truth all along, and asks, You didn't tell her what Marge Henderson said about the house, did you? Shh, she might hear you. No, of course not. Anyway, Marge was beside herself with grief. She didn't know what she was saying. Maybe not, but she said it pretty clearly. It was the house that got her. That's what she said. Sally checks if Melissa is asleep, and she isn't, but the aunt doesn't know any better. Sometime after Sally and Pete go to bed, Melissa hears the disembodied thought speak of Susan calling out her name. She looks out the window to see the door in Susan's attic is open and then quickly shuts, and Melissa steals her aunt's keys to go investigate the attic. The lights are on in the dollhouse's attic as well, and she sees a light coming through the keyhole of a door that should lead outside. She opens the door and stands in front of it like Carol Ann sitting in front of the TV and poltergeist, and she discovers that the house suddenly has a whole new wing. Susan hobbles out of a door, calling out, Melissa? Susan, you're going the wrong way! Melissa? But either Susan can't hear her, or she's playing some sort of mind games. Melissa goes to step into the hallway and chase Susan when Uncle Pete pulls her back. She rambles about saving Susan, and Pete shows her that the door opens to a three-story drop. The next day, Pete is on his way to board the attic door up, and Sally is wondering why the door was ever put there in the first place. And girl, same. I always used to wonder why some houses just had a door on an upper story with no stairs or anything. I mean, sure, 
probably someone just got lazy and never put a patio in like they had originally intended, but I prefer the mystery of it all. Melissa is back on her shit and going off about how Susan is still in the house and explaining what she saw when she opened that godforsaken door. I'm sure I saw her. At the end of a long corridor, there was this weird light. If Uncle Pete puts up that door, Susan will never be able to get out. Melissa! We need to take you to see a therapist. While her aunt and uncle are having a heated discussion about, I don't know, probably the weather or what to have for dinner or whatever straight people talk about, Melissa, I'm not snooping Chapman or whatever her last name is, starts rummaging through their drawers. She finds what she's looking for amongst various sewing and knitting equipment, a ball of yarn and a hammer, and takes off to Susan's house. This time, she means business and uses the hammer to quite literally break and enter. Years later, Melissa would describe this moment as the beginning of her life of crime. Her origin story, if you will. Up to the attic, she undoes the work her uncle literally just did, and opens the door to see the hallway yet again. Tentatively, she dips her toe in the waters. The floor seems solid, so she ties one end of the yarn to the doorknob and jumps into the hallway, falling to the ground as her aunt lets out a scream that makes time stand still. Or, you know, stands on the floor and does a little jump to double check, and then starts desperately seeking Susan. The whole house begins to violently shake, All of us smart people figured that out when she entered the hall, because it's called the tale of the doll maker. God, get it together, Melissa. Aunt Sally, back here in the dollhouse! Please, no, wait, in the dollhouse! It's no use. She can't hear you. It's Susan, and gasp! She's becoming a doll for the rest of her life, maybe even the rest of eternity. She'll have skin as flawless as porcelain because it will be. She'll get to live in a house, which they don't know this yet because it's like 1994, but most millennials will not ever have that opportunity. And especially with this arrangement where she doesn't pay any rent, she'll never have to work. She'll never go to the grocery store. There's actually very few downsides to Melissa's predicament, but Melissa selfishly wants to save her. It's the attic. Yes, I'm going to take you back to the attic. The attic. Yes, the attic. Don't worry, everything's going to be all right. Susan probably could explain more, but chooses to be vague and aloof. Melissa goes back to where she entered the dollhouse, but the door is missing. Oh my god, the door! It was right here! She turns back and counts the rooms in the hall and realizes what we've all known since we laid eyes on the stupid little dollhouse. Just like Susan's house. The attic. It makes sense now. There's a bureau in front of the wall where the closet should be. And Melissa can't even get it to budge. She goes back to Susan to enlist her help, and Susan says she can. The bureau's too big. You've got to help me. I can't. You have to! If we don't move that bureau, we can't ever get out of here! And Susan pulls one of her porcelain hands right out of her arm and slaps Melissa across the face with it for daring to question her. Melissa decides she'll try again, and this time, she gets the bureau to fall over without any effort whatsoever. She hauls Susan's lifeless body up to the attic, where she's greeted by a group of stuffed animals. It's creepy. Also, there's the door. There it is, in exactly the same place. Bringing Susan over to the door, one of Susan's hands falls off, and Melissa nervously giggles and says, oops, and quickly sneaks the hand into Susan's pocket before she can see. But it doesn't really matter, because Susan is basically just a doll now. Susan, can you hear me? No. 
And I'm basically confused about how the timeline of this doll changing process works. It seems to start right away, but then it takes like months to progress. Susan was able to walk and talk when Melissa first found her, but now within like a 15 minute period, Susan is unable to walk or talk. So anyway, Melissa shoves Susan into a corner. She opens the door and it leads to the outside. That's impossible. The dollhouse is in their attic, not outside. Yeah, Melissa, but also Susan's house isn't inside the dollhouse. So how does that door lead inside the dollhouse? Melissa brings Susan over to the door, and even though she could just push her out and see what happens first, she sits in the door with Susan, and they jump out together. We cut to on Sally saying that it's her fault Melissa died that day, and we're back at the campfire with Betty Ann wrapping up the story. Well, it's my fault. Oh, it's not your fault. Don't go overreacting. I'm sure she'll turn up safe and sound. Oh, Peter. Look, I was so worried you disappeared. Just like Susan. I did. I disappeared just like Susan, and I found her. What are you saying? Look! And then Susan shows up in a nasty dress and smiles. Everyone is happy, and then we're back at the campfire, and Betty Ann says that Uncle Pete burned the dollhouse in a bonfire that night. They roasted marshmallows over the burning wreckage, and Melissa wondered where the door to the attic would lead now. Yeah. Where would it lead to? Oh, you awake? Yeah, yeah, not bad for a doll story. Everyone goes to leave when Kiki or someone notices Betty Ann left behind a doll. It looks just like Tucker. And Betty Ann says that's a story for another time. But guess what? That time never comes. This episode is probably the one that has stayed with me the most growing up. I was always fascinated with houses that had doors on upper stories that go nowhere, so I liked the idea of a story that gave that door a purpose. It might just be my nostalgia towards it, but I do really enjoy this episode. I wouldn't say it's a scary story per se, but it is an interesting story idea. I could see it being more fleshed out for a mature audience and making a good suspenseful supernatural mystery. I'm going to go ahead and give it 5 out of 5 doll's eyes and the stamp of approval by the Midnight Society by the powers vested in me by literally no one. Remember to like and subscribe if you'd like to see more episodes of me making fun of a show that I'm actually really fond of. Let me know down in the comments if you remember this episode or what episodes of Are You Afraid of the Dark you remember most. You can follow me over at Twitter at Brona is Gay, where I mostly just post gay nonsense. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you at the next gathering of the Midnight Society.